This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 983, recorded on February 10, 2023. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today here at the incubator in New York City, Dixon de Pommier. Hello, Vincent and everybody else. Pleasure to be here. Dixon, it's good to see you again here at the incubator. Oh, I'm getting used to this. I'm actually uh, enjoying being surrounded by science again. Ah, nothing like it, is there? No, there isn't, actually. Also joining us from Madison, New Jersey, Brianne Barker. Hi, great to see everyone. Um, I'm hoping that for you in New York City, it's as lovely as it is here. It's 55 and sunny, which is right. not really February, but it's pretty nice out there. 14C and sunny, I guess. It's close. Yeah, it's very nice out. Too nice. I, I mean, I complain about the cold weather and then it gets warm and I complain about that. So <laughs> I should just stay inside, right? Record podcasts. Uh, yeah, I guess that's what I do. All right. We have a guest for you today. Hailing from, what do they call it, the City of Brotherly Love, Philadelphia? Is that right, Dixon? That's right, it is. At the University of Pennsylvania. I believe this is his third uh, trip on TWIV. Scott Hensley, welcome back. Hey, nice to be here. The City of Brotherly Love and Sisterly Affection is is uh, the, the full description of Philadelphia. Oh, yeah, they've got a new, uh, they put an I ad see. on. I see. <laughs> So it make it uh, even for everyone. I think that's so. A Scott, are you a, 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 a an Eagles fan? Uh, yes, I think you know. Living in this city <laughs> and around these parts, you have to be an Eagles fan. I <laughs> I grew up in Maryland, so I am admittedly uh, a Ravens fan, a Baltimore Ravens fan. Oh yeah. Uh, but yeah. the Eagles are a close second. Okay. Pretty sure this weekend you also need to be an Eagles fan. We're it's, just hoping uh, for a good game on Sunday. That's all. It's crazy around here right now. I looked it up, Vincent, and the last time I was on, guess what? It was February 11th, 2018, and the oh. Eagles had just won the Super Bowl. Oh. It was uh, okay. We recorded the day after the parade in Philadelphia. So, <laughs> hey, here we are. How many years later? February 11th, 2018. How about that? Almost to the day. Wow, Five I didn't years. know that. Interesting. Now, now and, Scott, <laughs> uh, just before we get to the science what happened to the mummers? I haven't uh, seen them in years. The mummers are alive and well, uh, I, <laughs> I believe. Uh, the, the COVID pandemic did cancel uh, the parade, I think, the first year. I think maybe weather canceled it. The set. There, was, there was a time, uh, you know, where the mummers were not around. But if, if I'm not mistaken, New Year's Day is sort of their big thing. And, and I think... Right. It, I think it went on without a hitch this year. So oh, I think the mummers are back. Huh. Glad to hear it. So we're going to hear from that podcast uh, later when we talk about your work, because you had said we, we, you were already starting some of this back then, and you mentioned it. So we'll see what you said. I got it queued up and ready to play. <laughs> Don't you remember in 1963? No, <laughs> Scott, Scott said, hey, you know, we had uh, talked about it. Let's play it. And you um, said this is epi episode, which ep which one 480, is it? 480. 480. The PFU and you're a chew. So I actually <laughs> um, have an assignment about that. And my students uh, sometimes listen to parts of that. My students love the Gassoon Type 2. Yeah, it's they very cool. They think that that is the best thing they've ever heard of. And they always want to learn more <laughs> about it. Very good. All right, we'll come back to that. A few announcements. First, uh, just I want to tell everyone again, a research assistant position is available in Amy Rosenfeld's lab at the FDA, the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Review, and they uh, that would be to work on enteroviruses, in particular how cross-reactive enterovirus antibodies may affect virus pathogenesis. This is, uh, again, a research assistant You'll be working in the laboratory. BSL-2 conditions, BS in science is required. And we will have a link in the show notes to a PDF describing uh, the position and an email where you can uh, email Amy and get more information. Secondly, 
Registration is now open for ASV 2023. That meeting will be held in Athens, Georgia, June 24th to 28th. Go to asv.org slash ASV2023 for more information. And finally, we have an announcement from Volker Vote, who's over at the University of Bern, about the, um, what is this, 16th International Nidovirus Symposium. It's happening May 14th to 18th in Montreux, Switzerland. Who wouldn't want to go there? Made famous by the... What was the name of that band? Deep Purple. Smoke on the Water. But they also have a jazz festival there that, that, that's quite well. Attended. Yeah, it's at the Montreux Music and Convention Center. Maybe right. it's the same place. Right. Anyway, um, this is, um, uh, you know, big deal. It's, it's coronaviruses, nidoviruses, and uh, they have a great program. We'll put the PDF for the program in the show notes. Lots of great speakers. Uh, Volker and Isabella Eckerly and Ronald, Ronald Dykeman are co-organizing keynote lectures by Dr. Mike Ryan from WHO, Christian Drosten, Ralph Barrick, and Kanta Subaro. And we will be doing a TWIV there. So um, you, you can register. We'll put a link to the, to the registration. And he closes, we need a virologist, <laughs> are big fans of TWIV, and we look forward to welcome you in Montreux. A neato, you know, they're neat. The neato virologists are neat, Dixon. Indeed. Neato. Also, um, don't forget to join the Microbe TV Discord server. We'll put a link for that in the show notes as well. So you were on TWIV 460 and 480, Scott. 460, I think I came to Philly to do that one. Uh, yeah, that was did. great. That was um, Susan Weiss was on. It was a panel discussion yeah. uh, about science at Penn. I think we had Susan Weiss. Uh, who else was on there? We have we we should look it up. Uh, the guy with the uh, Brooklyn accent. Um, he's in the. Uh, he works on herpes viruses. Oh, Gary, Gary Cohen. Yeah, Gary Cohen. Gary. Yeah, and he's, he's also fantastic. the lady who works on defective interfering particles who left. Carolina uh, Lopez. Carolina, Carolina yeah. Lopez. At least I know what they do. I don't remember their names, but I know what they do. It's a good thing you didn't hold that at the Music Center Discord. Would have never played out. Uh, yes, that's true. <laughs> And then 480 was uh, online. And so even though we did your history, Scott, remind us uh, where you're from and where where did you study? Well, I'm from a little town in Maryland, uh, and I went to school at the University of Delaware. I was first introduced to science in the form of studying uh, cucumber beetles at Delaware. (laughs) That's that's how I I thought it was uh, the biggest thing in the world. I was extracting DNA and coming up with phylogenetic trees of cucumber beetles. They're actually... They're actually uh, a big pest. Uh, I went to University of Vermont to start grad school, uh, and then I transferred to Penn. Uh, and so I received a PhD in cell molecular biology at Penn. Uh, my thesis project was evaluating adenoviruses as vaccine vectors, uh, and, and that, that sure has become popular over the last couple of years. Mm. Uh, we were studying innate immune properties of those, uh, of those vectors. And then I did a postdoc with John Udell and Jack Benick, at the NIH. Uh, That's where I started studying influenza viruses and became very interested in this problem of antigenic drift, how how these viruses change over time. I started my lab up at the Wistar Institute, which is across the street, in 2010, and I moved over to Penn a couple years after that. So Mm. hard to believe, but I've had my lab 13 years now, and uh, I'm, I'm currently in the Department of Microbiology in the School of Medicine at Penn. I just saw John Udell two weeks ago, and I told him you you were coming on. He said hi. Yeah, he's a big fan of your work. He said. <laughs> yeah, John's John's great. It's it's so fun to talk science with him, and you know I often think back of of the days in his lab, and you know when when problems come up in my own lab, I I kind of think what would John do, right? Uh, he's, yeah, uh, sure. He's a funny guy, but he's he's he is a great mentor and a great scientist. On top of nope. that, nobody says what would Vinny do. <laughs> that's okay it's so fine if you, if you want to record i can tell you what i would do though you do the right thing that's what you would do i want to talk about your recently re- released paper a multivalent nucleoside modified mrna vaccine against all known influenza virus subtypes uh, which was out in science and um i just wanted to point out so we have um 
Louise Moncla on the paper, and, and we interviewed her for a, an episode of Tuivo. So what's the connection? Did you collaborate, or was she in your lab, or, or what was going on Yeah, there? so, well, Louise is a new faculty member here at Penn. We were oh, right, happy. Right. <laughs> yeah, we're happy to recruit her. She just launched her lab. She's an assistant professor in the vet school here at Penn, and she's studying uh, avian influenza viruses, among other things. Um, and she helped with some of the phylogenetic analyses comparing the Excellent. different uh, immunogens that we that we tested in, in the study. So uh, okay. as it turned out, I met Luis when she was still a postdoc with Trevor Bedford. I had mm -hmm. a joint lab retreat with Trevor, with Trevor uh, Bedford and Jesse Bloom. The three labs got mm -hmm. together back in the day. I don't know how many years ago, certainly before the pandemic. And um, it's, it's so good to see Luis here. We're happy to have her here on campus. That's right. And we, when we talked to her last year, she was still in Seattle, but getting ready to move. I remember that. Yes. Okay. And the first author is Claude, Claudia Arevalo, right? Is that correct? One first author or two? Yeah. So Claudia is this fantastic grad student or was a fantastic grad student in my lab, uh, an immunology grad student. I tend to have some of the virology students as well as immunology students. And she led the research. She, um, essentially drove the project forward. Most of these experiments were completed before the pandemic, uh, wow. before the COVID pandemic. And actually the study was probably <laughs> delayed about a year because Claudia was wrapped up in studying antibodies to SARS-CoV-2 as, as my whole lab was for about a year there. So Claudia gets a lot of credit. I mean, obviously all the authors on the, on the paper contributed, but Claudia uh, uh, really drove the science forward. I was going to ask you uh, if you started a, before the famous COVID mRNA vaccine. So obviously you had, right? Yeah, well, that's the funny thing, right? And you, <laughs> we've, I've heard uh, some folks in the media say, well, isn't it great? They're, they're using the technology developed for COVID and extending <laughs> it to flu. What are they going to think of next? Uh, and it's, it's the other way around. We've, and you, we could play the clip when we yeah. talked about mRNAs in, in 2018. But I've been working with Drew Weissman. Uh, for a number of years, I, I don't know exactly when, probably 2015 or so, we started working together. Of course, Drew has spent half his life working with mRNA vaccines, but I was able to uh, work on some of the earliest flu mRNA projects with Drew. And uh, yeah, we've been developing this technology for a long time, and uh, we knew how promising it was before the COVID pandemic, but uh, I didn't know how, how close we were to you know, coming up with something that could translate so quickly. So the, the, the TWIV we did was 2018. Let's hear what you were saying, okay? <laughs> Hopefully we can all hear this. We've been working with these genetic-based vaccines that look super promising, uh, these modified RNA-based vaccines. Mm -hmm. um, and I tell you, in animal models, you, you've never seen an antibody titer so high. Uh, these, th these vaccines, these modified RNA-based vaccines have drawn a lot of interest. Zika. Uh, there's been, you know, some high impact papers with Zika, uh, a number of different viruses. We've we've been working uh, with Drew Weissman here at Penn, uh, uh, evaluating these for flu, and it's remarkable. They, I mean, the antibody titers are just uh, sort of if you, a natural infection in a mouse might give you a, a 320 titer, you could dilute your serum out one to 320 and still get a uh, you know, antibody detection and it, with these vaccines, you're, you're like 10,000 or something. It's, it's, wow. it's, it's remarkable. Uh, so I'm really excited about those, you know, the, the, they're interesting as well because it's a genetic based thing. And, and so, you know, for your listeners, you, you know, you basically take an, an RNA encoding hemagglutinin protein and you couple it with a lipid and that's injected into your arm hmm. or sub Q and then your cells, so your your muscle cells, for example, will actually produce the hemagglutinin. Well, now you don't have to worry about egg adaptation. Uh, right. You don't you don't have to worry about proper glycosylation because you know insect cells, for example, don't glycosylate the same way as mammalian cells. Uh, I think there's a lot of advantages for 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 this kind of approach. All right. So you just said uh, we're working on these mRNA vaccines with Drew Weissman, and you never saw such high antibody titers in animals. And they're amazing. And this is 2018. <laughs> there you go. I, re I I couldn't hear the clip right now, but I reviewed it this morning in preparation for today's show. <laughs> and uh, yeah, what a crazy time. Uh, the story goes, and I don't know how much we went into it last episode, but Drew 
I was an assistant professor at the time and Drew sent me an email saying, hey, I have this mRNA technology. Uh, you, you know something about flu. Uh, uh, let, can, can we get it into uh, some sort of flu model? And I, and I remember thinking that it was a hokey idea, uh, thinking that, you know, come on, DNA vaccines, I mean, they have shown some promise, but certainly have not lived up to sort of, you know, what we thought they would be. But here's Drew Weissman, seemed like a nice enough guy, and I thought to myself, I'm an assistant professor, what the heck, I don't have too much to lose, let's, let's work with this guy. And I do remember when my technician showed me the first data, we designed these mRNAs expressing hemagglutinin, very much like the SARS-CoV-2 vaccines expressing spike. And um, I, I thought it was a mistake when I, when I actually saw the data. Uh, typical antibody titers are, yeah, 40, 80, 160 if you're lucky. The titers that we were able to achieve in mice were 10,000 or something. They were really high antibody titers. And this has been just such a great collaboration with Drew. Uh, throughout the years, we have several manuscripts on this. And, and it, it's nice to highlight this. Number one, I think, uh, highlight the fact that we worked on these vaccines well before the COVID pandemic. Number one, it's, it's important to highlight the fact that this is not just some new technology. I know a lot of the sort of anti-vaxxers have, have uh, pushed a narrative that this vaccine approach has just been uh, sped up. And that's not the case, right? Drew has been working on this forever. And uh, certainly other models, uh, flu, our studies, and, and other viruses have been studied for a number of years before the pandemic. That's one thing to highlight here. And the second thing is uh, go ahead and, and, and I've said it once, I've said a hundred times, if you like vaccines, go fund basic research, okay? Because all of our studies with flu, mRNAs, uh, look, we were just uh, in the lab uh, doing experiments to test different vaccine platforms, not knowing that this kind of, these kind of data would actually help uh, in a pandemic against a virus that we didn't even know about. So I think those are the, the two, two interesting things, kind of looking back on those 2018 comments. Um, hmm. And it's been a wild, wild ride. I'm, I'm very proud of Drew and I'm proud of uh, Katie and others at Penn who have really developed the technology. And uh, it's, it's been, it's just been a real rewarding experience seeing, seeing how useful these vaccines have been over, over the course of the pandemic. I'm excited to see these things move forward for, for flu, not only from the universal pre-pandemic front, what our manuscript is really addressing, but also on a more seasonal basis. I think mRNA vaccines have many attributes that make them, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a real step forward in the right direction for seasonal vaccination as well. So tell us how the, the original collaboration with Drew was just a, probably a single hemagglutinin, I guess. So how did you migrate to 20? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, we could, we could put, I could send you the papers, Vince, and we could, we could put them in on the webpage. We have several papers where we worked with Drew expressing a single hemagglutinin, as, as you just said, uh, where we show that these are very immunogenic and that we get antibody responses against different domains of the hemagglutinin. The very top of hemagglutinin is called the head. The part of hemagglutinin that's closer to the virus membrane is called the stalk or the stem. These vaccines elicit such high levels of antibodies that you get uh, antibodies detected against both of those domains, even these domains like the stalk, which are usually subdominant. Uh, so yeah, how do we, uh, what is the whole basis here of, of, of what we were trying to do? This stems back to Thomas Francis Jr. and uh, his famous essay on the doctrine of original antigenic sin. It seems like there's this new push to get, get rid of this term of original antigenic sin. I, I'll go into my grave continuing to say original antigenic sin because I love it. I think it's such a, a colorful phrase, but it is often misinterpreted. Uh, but I like using the phrase because it gives it, it gives credit to Francis and his colleagues who who figured all this out uh, 50 years ago. By the and way, so, uh, your your bo your old mentor John Udell rails against it because this is a, a part of the immune response. Why are we making it a bad thing? Well, it's not a bad thing, and John's right. And, and John knows the original studies, I'm sure, but a lot of folks don't. And so, what did the original studies show? What Francis showed is that when an adult gets infected with flu there's a boosting of his or her antibody responses against strains, influenza strains that they encountered in childhood. 
So you get infected with an antigenically distinct virus later in your life, and you have this boosting. Uh, Francis made it pretty darn clear in that original essay that he said that he thought the sin of this wasn't so much that you have immune memory getting recalled. The sin is that you're only infected with a limited number of viruses in your childhood. It's a sin that our immune system doesn't have the opportunity to encounter many different pathogens early in our life. And if you read the essay, uh, uh, Francis ends that essay uh, dreaming of, uh, of vaccines, essentially, uh, that could replace original antigenic sin with initial blessings of induced immunity. And what are initial blessings of induced immunity? He spelled it out. I think he said something along the lines like, I dream of chemically purified pools of, of, of proteins that would, would give this blessing. The idea is to have a vaccine to deliver uh, uh, immunogens very early in your life so that we don't have memory that is so focused on a limited set of antigens. The, the, the blessing part is essentially a multivalent vaccine that would be able to induce immunity against all different influenza strains that could come down the road. The fact is, when we think about this from a pandemic potential, we don't know what's going to cause the next pandemic. Right now, we're, we're certainly concerned about H5 avian viruses, which, uh, as you all know, have, have circulated uh, at this unprecedented rate among birds, wild birds. We don't know if that's going to be our next pandemic strain. Could it be an H7? Could it be an influenza subtype that we don't really uh, uh, think about at this point? Our strategy going into this paper was to create an mRNA vaccine, a multivalent vaccine that could introduce to an infant's immune system, every influenza subtype that they may encounter down the line. Mm -hmm. The goal wasn't to induce neutralizing antibodies against all of these influenza strains, but rather to induce immune memory, a certain set of memory B cells and T cells that can get recalled upon exposure, even with antigenically distinct viruses uh, later in life. And as we showed in the paper, these vaccines are highly immunogenic in naive mice, and naive ferrets, uh, we get antibody responses against all 20 components. But maybe more importantly, we show that these vaccines are actually immunogenic in animals who had already experienced flu. And so we think that these vaccines may be good for inducing this initial blessing of induced immunity. But what we like to say is that they may be good in absolution of original antigenic sin as well. Oh, so much religion today. <laughs> It's Friday, huh? Uh, well, I, li I like Francis's language. Again, I, uh, I, I think his, uh, imagine writing an essay like that now. Uh, it would, Forget it. it would, Forget. Uh, well, a lot of people are <laughs> yeah. calling it imprinting because they don't want to use the sin part, right? Well, because people think sin and, you know, people think different things. Does a couple critical questions that we don't know the answer to, both with flu and SARS-CoV-2, do these prior exposures really impact the ability to make de novo antibody responses? Still don't really know the answer for flu. I mean, certain studies show that could, could be the case. Uh, look, if you have pre-existing immunity, it's immune memory. There's often cross-reactive antibodies. Mm. And uh, these are a good thing when you think about protection. They limit the amount of virus from these subsequent exposures. So then if you... Uh, you know, fail to mount a good response against that second virus, well, it might just be because the immune response from the first virus did a good job at limiting virus replication. You want to call that a sin? I mean, it's not a sin, right? The sin is, is again, just a missed opportunity of having great induction of immune memory early in your life. But there are many fundamental questions uh, that remain uh, as they relate to how these first exposures impact subsequent immune responses. So I like the word imprinting. I, I, I love the Katie Gostick uh, paper that first coined the term immune imprinting uh, from Jamie Lloyd Smith's lab and Mike Warby's lab. Uh, but again, anytime I have an opportunity to say the phrase original <laughs> antigenic sin, I try to, I try to do it. Um, so I have um, been really excited by um, some of the data I've learned about original antigenic sin in terms of number of exposures to antigen. Um, so how many doses um, were you giving in the study? How many doses did the mouse receive? And did that change anything about breadth or anything of that nature? Yeah, it's a good question. In the mouse studies, we 
uh, infected mice, well, we did the experiments completely where we just vaccinated naive mice and measured their antibody response. Those were the initial set of experiments were designed that way. Uh, but we did experiments where we infected mice with, with a virus, H1N1, either a virus that was closely matched to what was in the strain or into, in the vaccine as well as a mismatch. And then three months later, we vaccinated the mice. So that was, that was it, just one infection, one vaccination. Um, I do think it's interesting, you know, not to go too far aside from, uh, from the paper, but looking at the experience with mRNA vaccines in, in humans with SARS-CoV-2, and certainly if you look at individuals who have been exposed to the original SARS-CoV-2 strains, they get the BA4, BA5 vaccine. A lot of that response, that early response is coming from immune memory. It's coming from uh, uh, a quick recall response. And we actually have a paper that was just posted on BioArchive from John Weary, is the senior author, uh, a, a fantastic trainee named Mark Painter completed these studies showing, and this is consistent with other studies that have been published. Here's getting to your point, Brianne. If, if you give a second dose, what happens? Because what you get during that, during that, that first BA4, BA5, you get a recall of memory B cells, but you're starting to see some new memory B cells in there as well. And so now you get hit again with BA4, BA5. I really want to see those studies done more exhaustively. Do you now start getting a much more neutralizing antibody response against BA4, BA5? At least, now going back to our paper, at least in our paper, it seemed like uh, priming of, of those mice with the H1M1, it, it, the, the concern was you give the 20-valent vaccine in those mice that it would just be an H1-focused biased response because you have immune, mem immune memory against H1, but that's not what we found. We found everything lit up. And, you know, Gabriel, Victoria, and others have shown, and, and I'm really interested in studying this in my own lab, that the antigenic distance between the first virus and the second virus, that, that's, that's, that's everything in this case, where you have a complete match. Well, that's a good thing. You, you recall memory, uh, you have a match of, uh, of, of the epitopes between the first and second virus. If they're very different viruses, it's not even that much of a concern. And that's probably the case a lot with our subtype where you have 20 different subtypes, even they're so mismatched compared to what those mice had seen before. Where you get into this hairy situation is where, you know, you have some match and, and some mismatch. And that is, uh, you know, exa the example is kind of what's happening with Omicron, the BA4, BA5 boosters. So I, I have like millions of questions because this is stuff that I, <laughs> I really find interesting. But if when I look at the paper, um, you know, looking at the antibody levels to your 20 HA uh, mRNA vaccine um, and seeing this beautiful breadth um, across uh, type A and type B viruses um, compared to the, you know, one mRNA uh, vaccine so is really uh, impressive. Um, so awesome. My, so my next question is, why 20? Can why you 20? do 50? Well, Can you do 100? Can you do all the viruses and never have to get a vaccine ever again? <laughs> I, I, I love it. Let's do it. Uh, and I, you know, I think when you think of resource limited countries, it's uh, it's 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 hard to get individuals in a healthcare setting. And we had a previous study showing that these mRNA vaccines are very immunogenic, even in the context of maternal antibodies. A lot of times maternal antibodies will actually inhibit vaccine induced responses by binding to the vaccine and sort of dumbing them up. Um, so imagine I imagine a world where we where we have just that a vaccine that has 100 different immunogens in it. And let's give it to in these low resource countries where you might not see a kid for another couple of years after birth, maybe you give that vaccine in the first few days of life and that, that individual is protected. Here's the thing about multivalency. So why do we include 20? We just included every influenza A subtype and the two influenza B lineages. There's no limit of how many mRNAs you can include, but what's limited is the dose. Mm -hmm. We've seen that with the vaccines that we've used for SARS-CoV-2, 100 micrograms, 300 micrograms. I mean, you are starting to have uh, people, uh, these, these doses of vaccine are, are, are very safe, but certainly some people lay in bed for a day, right? Uh, there, are si there are these side effects, these uh, transient side effects at these doses. We certainly can't go tenfold higher in dose. That wouldn't be tolerated. So every time you add another component to this vaccine, you're essentially reducing the dose of each individual component. And so that's 
something we're looking at very closely in my lab right now. With the 20-valent vaccine, we used a relatively high dose in mice. And, well, how low can we go? We haven't really done those experiments. We're trying them now. Um, we essentially use 1 20th of a dose uh, compared to the controls in, in these experiments that had a single HA. Uh, I, I'm happy to report we've now done non-human primate experiments with this dose of 50 micrograms and um, super immunogenic, even in the context of pre-existing immunity. So uh, we'll see how things move forward, but the valency, I think it's just an endless uh, 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 opportunity there. But dose is the hiccup. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta, there's a cap in that dose. Remember, Brianne, that paper we did where- Oh yeah, absolutely. I just wanted to hear. <laughs> mice have no problem with more because they have a defense, but humans can't handle more. Right? I Oh yeah, no, I know. I remember that paper. I think that paper is super fascinating. So, I mean, Scott, with just rhinoviruses, you have at least 200 that you'd have to do. And, and maybe you have to split it up into multiple doses, right? But even that's not a problem if you can do it. Vincent, if there's anyone out there who wants to do a postdoc and make a multivalent <laughs> rhinovirus vaccine, please send me an email because I any new postdoc in the lab, I try to tell them to do that, and and well, I think um, it would be interesting. It's, it, and it, it, to make it broader, rhinoviruses are enteroviruses technically, so there are a lot of enteroviruses too that you could include. I, I'll, I'll hook you up with Amy at the FDA because she's working on all of those, and you guys might want to do something there. But I think that's a, a beautiful uh, thing to do, sure, for sure. So tell us about the uh, the challenge experiment you did. I mean, did. Give people a sense for how that worked. Sure, yeah. So we did experiments both in mice and ferrets, and mice are, are great for the study of flu. We have very highly adapted uh, strains of influenza. In our original manuscript, we actually didn't challenge mice with a match strain because the whole goal here was just to have a vaccine that would induce immunity in the case of a pandemic. And even if we knew H5 is going to cause a pandemic, our ability to actually pick the specific strain that would cause that pandemic, it's the slim chances we would ever nail that correctly. So for initial challenge studies in mice, what we did was we picked a mismatch strain. When I say mismatch, you know, out of each subtype, H1, H2, H3, H4, there are zillions of different strains. So our H1 component was based on an influenza strain from 2015, I believe. And we challenged mice with an H1 strain from 1934. So we vaccinated the animals and we challenged a month later. We've done these experiments several months later. We challenged with this virus called A Puerto Rico 8 1934. A lot of people call this PR8. I like to joke that if you just open up a vial of this virus in the animal facility, the mice start running to the other side of, of their <laughs> cages because it is the most pathogenic virus in mice. It's heavily mouse adapted. And so if you want a stringent mouse model, this is, this is the virus strain that you want to choose. And importantly, again, it's mismatched to the vaccine component that we had in our vaccine. What do we see? Well, this vaccine did not prevent virus replication. You look at virus replication in the airways, looked the same in unvaccinated and vaccinated animals for several days. But what we what we saw is faster clearance. The mice lose weight. The clinical scores look not so great the first few days, but then several days into the infections, the clinical scores drop in the vaccinated animals. The virus gets cleared, and most of those animals survive. What is this based on? Well, we did passive transfer studies, and we found that in this mismatch model, uh, where the challenge strain is not matched to the uh, vaccine strain, the antibodies can, can delay death for a few days, but not completely protected. Uh, we did some T cell depletion studies that didn't seem to make a difference. But what we think is that just the memory B cells being there to be able to be recalled undergo somatic hypermutation, start adapting to that new strain. That's probably the important thing, along with soluble antibody that may work through non-neutralizing mechanisms like ADCC. Now, reviewers said, why don't you challenge with match strains? And we did that. And sure enough, uh, when we challenged with a match strain, complete protection. Mm -hmm. Mice might have lost a little weight for a day or so, uh, but 100% protection. When we looked at viruses in the lung and vaccinated animals, you couldn't detect the virus. 
And um, when we passively transferred antibodies in those experiments, they were fully able to protect. So neutralizing antibodies are able to protect. Uh, all the same stuff in the ferret uh, experiments. Ferret experiments, we only did challenges with mismatch, but it very much looked like the mouse mismatch challenges where it wasn't sterilizing immunity, but the animals uh, rebounded quicker and virus was cleared faster. Mm -hmm. I like to draw the analogy now to what's seen in Omicron. Okay, forget about the BA4, BA5 booster. What do we see with mRNA vaccines against SARS-CoV-2? mRNA vaccines provided essentially sterilizing immunity early in the pandemic, pre-Omicron. You got vaccinated, you didn't have symptomatic uh, COVID. What happened after Omicron? Well, that's like equivalent of five years or 10 years of influenza an uh, evolution, that jump between the early Wuhan strains and Omicron. What happened in that scenario? Well, those antibodies elicited by the vaccine, the original vaccine did not necessarily prevent infection with Omicron. But it is amazing to me that across the board, you still have great protection against severe disease and death, even with those original SARS-CoV-2 vaccines in Omicron. That, that boggles my mind. I mean, go out and get your BA4, BA5 booster to, you know, transiently get your neutralizing antibodies up and everything else. But protection against survival and uh, hospitalization is greatly reduced by those initial vaccines. I think the same kind of thing is happening in our flu studies. If you prime the immune system with every influenza subtype, guess what? You don't have to get it right. If there's an H7 strain that we don't know about that emerges a few years down the road, as long as you have that fundamental immune memory established, we think that's enough to get a quick recall response to at least eliminate severe disease and death. Why does the uh, conventional flu vaccine not do that? Why does mRNA do it? Well, you know, I think the conventional vaccine gets a bad rap as it, uh, <laughs> as, uh, as it has as it relates to uh, reducing deaths, even in years where the uh, where there's a major mismatch, mm -hmm. a major vaccine mismatch. Last year was a good example. We had a bad H3 mismatch last year. Even in those cases, the seasonal vaccine does a pretty good job at preventing uh, deaths. Uh, study after study have sh has shown that. And now, whether how long lived that is, is another question. Seasonal vaccines uh, elicit a response that isn't super long lived. Um, but but those vaccines do do the same thing, even in times of mismatch. I've had folks talk to me about the current H5 situation. Mm -hmm. For the listeners, there we have an H5 uh, uh, strain circulating across the globe now at unprecedented rates, birds are dropping dead. We have uh, infections of uh, minks, for example, a mink farm in, in Spain. Uh, sea otters and other animals have, have uh, you know, appear to be possibly spreading the virus from animal to animal. It looks like a bad situation. By the way, we are developing an mRNA vaccine based on that sequence alone. But the question is, should we actually use stockpiles of uh, H5 vaccine that was developed in 2005 to at least have that on hand against this strain. And I would say, yes. I mean, I think that would probably provide some sort of protection. Um, so seasonal vaccines, I, I, I think there's a lot of unique properties of mRNA vaccines that are good. For example, inducing very long-lived germinal center reactions that give rise to many different types of antibodies. That's also probably critical for inducing de novo responses in the context of pre-existing immunity. But inactive vaccines aren't all, all bad. I think the seasonal vaccines that we have now are pretty good at, at preventing these severe uh, uh, infections. So you mentioned a few things about longevity uh, of the responses. And of course, that would be really important given that we can't predict when in the future a pandemic might occur. Um, and so do you have any idea about what the longevity of some of these responses might look like? Um, and, you know, if we were to, say, vaccinate with a 20 mRNA vaccine, would that um, eliminate the need for the seasonal vaccine each year? Yeah, so good questions there. And I don't know, in humans, I would say at least three years, right? Or how, how many years are we? Well, not three years, two and a half years, whenever... Uh, the first mRNA vaccines were rolled out for COVID. Uh, those vaccines still 
you know, have been shown, you can still find very good immune memory in that case. Now, not neutralizing antibodies per se, but memory B cells being able to be recalled. Uh, so the longevity is something we have to look at. If you look at influenza infections, what's the longevity of a memory B cell following flu infection? 90 years, probably. Hmm. Jim Crow, in one of my all-time favorite papers, uh, made monoclonal antibodies from individuals who survived the 1918 pandemic. And he did that when they were 90 years old. Uh, so <laughs> you could do the math what year that was. And sure enough, he was able to make monoclonals that could react to 1918. It's, it's, wow. it's remarkable. Uh, so mRNAs, we'll see. I think, I think that the memory B cells seem to be super long-lived. In mice, we've measured antibodies over the course of a year, and they don't drop as much as what we see in humans. I think it's interesting. If you look at a mouse response, it's pretty, pretty you know, for, for a year, following mRNA vaccination, it's, um, it is stable. And in humans, you definitely have a decline. Uh, but if you look at the memory B cell pool, it seems to be, uh, seems to be a, around for, for a long time. What was the so second we've... part of the question? I, oh, sorry. Oh, my second part of the question is was whether what you whether we could sort of stop doing a seasonal vaccine or not oh, having, have to yes. seasonally vaccinate as frequently. Yeah. So I think you know I think that we can improve mRNA vaccines for seasonal vaccination, but seasonal vaccination the goal was to induce neutralizing antibodies to prevent you from getting infected, and I think we mRNA vaccines can be utilized in a way to make that process better, faster to produce, faster to update, probably more immunogenic. I don't think this replaces seasonal vaccination. I think this is something that I envision you get once. Maybe you get a booster every five or 10 years. I don't know. Uh, we, you know, we are starting to think about human studies and hopefully they launch this year or next year. Uh, and those are the kind of things we're gonna be looking at, dosing schedules. But again, the idea is not to induce, you know, this serum level of antibody that's super high and neutralizing. It's just to have that memory component induced. And, and we think that is very long lived. So I want some clarification on T cells and flu vaccines, because depending on who we speak with, they are either not well induced by the, the, the split, the split flu vaccines that we currently use where they are. So what's the story? Are they, do they play any role or is it just neutralizing antibodies for three months? No. Yeah. Uh, T cells are very important in, in our response to flu, and so antibodies in T cells are are uh, ver both very important. If you look after flu vaccination, even with inactive vaccines, you see a very robust T cell response seven days after uh, okay. vaccination. And in fact, if you look at TFH cells, for example, antigen-specific TFH cells, they correlate very nicely with uh, the level of antibodies induced by the vaccine. Uh, how much, you know, CD8 T cells are induced? Well, that's probably not as much, but certainly this coordinated uh, induction of CD4s and CD8 and CD4s and B cells are important uh, as the CD4s help out the B cells as, as they get going. Uh, we're actively looking at this now. We have two years in a row now we vaccinated folks uh, at Penn with inactivated virus, inactivated vaccine, and we've uh, collected blood samples at different time points following vaccination. And we're working with John Weary's group and Mike Betts' group here at Penn. They are T-cell aficionados. Uh, and uh, they're, they're, they're discovering some pretty interesting things. I'm very interested in your birth effects for all the reasons that I rambled on about with Tommy Francis. Uh, <laughs> and I think it's really interesting to think about that not only on a B-cell level, but also a T-cell level. How does how do your initial viral encounters uh, early in your life shape not only your B cell repertoire, but your T cell repertoire? And so we are uh, uh, continuing these experiments. Here's, here's the problem trying to do these experiments in Philadelphia. Apparently only you know, 20 and 30 year olds want to participate in these kind of studies. Uh, you need to be a grad student or postdoc. Uh, you, know, uh, you don't need to be, but that, that's, that's who responds to our ads. So next year <laughs> we are, um, going to make this huge push to try to enroll, you know, some of those folks born in the 1960s. You're not that old, right? Uh, but we have to give some more incentive to get uh, uh, some of the older uh, folks to to participate in our studies. It's it's a real problem. It, most of these, a lot of these studies are all based on sort of age groups that are willing to come in and get the, you know, $25, $25 gift card or, or whatever. But uh, anyway, 
Uh, the, back to the original question, T cells are important for sure, and we're we're on it. We're working with uh, uh, John Weary and, and Mike Betts. But there are studies, for example, that have shown that CD4 T cells correlate with protection uh, uh, mm -hmm. in, in some of these flu challenge studies. So they're, they're, they're definitely very important. But in your paper, you showed mice lacking CD4 and CD8 T cells had similar survival rates <laughs> vaccinated mice with intact T cells. So what's going on there? Yeah, so in those experiments, we vaccinated the mice. So to be clear, they had their intact CD4s and uh, they had their intact T cells and B cells at time of vaccination. But what we did was we depleted the T cells right before viral challenge. So uh, again, we there's a lot of work to be done in trying to understand the mechanisms of protection. But we think that it's, it's likely uh, uh, due to those memory B cells being around and being able to respond and mm -hmm. undergo somatic hypermutation when confronted with an antigenically distinct strain. So the depletion does not take out the memory cells? Uh, the depletion does wipe out all the T cells, yeah. But the point is that the memory B cells are still around in those experiments. And uh, for them to be what they are, they okay. needed uh, okay. CD4 Got induction Got during it. vaccination. Got it. Okay, uh, thank you. My, my question was going to be, what was the um, timing um, and could there still have been some neutralizing antibodies at a high level um, at that point when you challenged? Um, do you know that it was the memory B cells and not neutralizing antibodies? Yeah, it's a good question. And uh, I'll have to go back and look at the timing. I think it was probably a month mm -hmm. later. Uh, but when we depleted T cells, we saw the same level of protection. To try to address the antibody question, we passively transferred antibodies from a vaccinated mouse into an unvaccinated mouse. And again, when the virus was closely matched to the vaccine, uh, the, the challenge virus, complete protection. Uh, mm -hmm. But when we did those experiments and challenged with the mismatch, a few days extended of survival, but those mice mostly succumbed from, from infection. So uh, yeah, it seems like there needs to be a cellular component al along with the antibody uh, uh, to get the job done. You know, I. I follow on Twitter and other places, people having these little B cell versus T cell arguments and it's cute and all, but, uh, you know, our immune system, we probably need both. Right. And so, so the, um, the, people ask me on our, our live streams, would this strategy, um, take, protect you against drifted, uh, viruses and, you know, you did that one experiment with a mismatch, which suggests that it might, but it's only one out of your 20, right? So is it worth looking at all of them to make sure they could all, you know, drifted or mismatched of all the HAs could be accommodated by this immunization? Yeah, yeah. So the challenge is almost more than a drifted. It's It really is, I mean, it depends, I guess you would say drifted, but it is PR8 uh, compared to that H1 in the vaccine. It, it's, there's, that the head is almost completely different. Right. Uh, but yeah, so we have done experiments with H5 now and we're getting ready to write that up. Uh, I do think it's important to look at other other components as well. You know, we're limited a little bit by the, the challenge strains that are available, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. but H5 is something that we've looked at. Um, we have other ideas for seasonal vaccination. Uh, you know, the sky's sort of the, the limit there when we think about <laughs> mRNAs and seasonal vaccines. I've seen press reports saying that the preclinical data with seasonal mRNA vaccines have not looked so great. Uh, but I'd like to actually see some of the hard data that in, involved with that and try to understand better what the readouts were in those studies. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're working on many different strategies to try to improve the breadth of seasonal influenza vaccines. Uh, those studies are ongoing. I don't think that this 20 HA vaccine replaces that. I think, again, look at look at the, imagine we all had that vaccine right now. We'd have some level memory B cells against all 20 subtypes. Mm -hmm. Say this H5 that's circulating like mad across the globe right now jumps into humans. You know, maybe we don't have to shut down the world, right? Maybe we have enough B cell immunity that we at least, we certainly wouldn't stop the spread of the virus, but we would have a certain level of B cell immunity that might limit the mortality rates to that new challenge strain or that new uh, pandemic strain. You can bet you 
that within uh, uh, a few days, we'd have an mRNA that was exactly mm. matched to that new strain mm. rolling into production. And that vaccine would serve as a booster to right. the immunity right. that was already established by our vaccine. And, and that's how I see this playing out. I, I don't think that this is a replacement for specifically trying to prevent infection from the, the viruses that are, are circulating in humans today or in the situation of a pandemic where clearly we wouldn't just rely on non-neutralizing antibodies yeah, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. to fight through the pandemic. I think the press interpretation of your paper is that this is all you would need. I don't think they got the nuance. Well, you know, the press did interpret it different ways. Um, <laughs> you know, I it, it's interesting, you know, some uh, and, and again, Twitter's an interesting place, but don't spend too much time on it because you, you'll get into a rabbit hole. I read some comments on Twitter saying like, wow, this is you know, more poison and, you know, this yeah, yeah. real anti-vaccine movement hung on to this paper a lot um, and said that, you know, this is, it's just, it's crazy the amount of uh, distrust, vaccine distrust that's out there, just completely scientifically misguided. Mm -hmm. uh, but then you had the other side of the aisle who was just like, well, then look, we don't need flu vaccines anymore. This is great. This is the, the <laughs> next best thing since sliced, sliced bread. And so I've discovered that you kind of have crazy people on both sides of the, <laughs> the spectrum and, uh, uh, you know, people that either want to uh, oversell something or, or just use uh, the, the story in some manipulative way to, to scare people. So, so the idea is maybe that th if we gave this vaccine pre-pandemic, if everyone had this, it keeps some people out of the hospital during the time where mm -hmm. we made the specific strain vaccine. Boom. That's it, right? And now with the mRNA technology, we have the infrastructure now to produce the vaccine. Certainly in other parts of the world and resource limited countries, we have to do a better job at increasing the capacity for, for play, other places in the world to produce these vaccines. But they are now we have the infrastructure at least to roll out doses very quickly. I think it would be great to do preclinical testing, phase one testing, phase two testing with these prototypic mRNA vaccines with H5, for example, uh, to get sort of all of that uh, uh, clinical testing uh, 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 through. And you can imagine it would almost be like a strain change, right? Right now, when we have our seasonal influenza vaccine strain change, it's not like we do uh, a, a, you know, a phase three trial every year. If we can get mRNAs to a point where we do clinical testing to show their safety, and, uh, uh, and then it would be much quicker to get these vaccines forward in the face of a pandemic. It would be analogous to uh, almost a strain update, something that we in mm. the flu field do every year. So someone asked me that the other night, and so let me ask you, uh, so going from the ancestral SARS-CoV-2 vaccine to the Omicron, is that different enough to say do more extensive trials or is a small phase one enough for that, do you think? Well, you know, I don't, honestly, it gets out of my expertise as far as the regulatory component <laughs> and the safety component. Yeah. Um, but I think that's where we're heading, right? With SARS-CoV-2. I think we're heading more towards a flu-like yeah. model where uh, there will be very limited testing as these things get updated each year. So when we when 2009 H1N1 emerged, what that that vaccine was made in about six months, right? The egg based vaccine. Uh, what kind of testing did we do of that? Just a phase one, really? Immunogenicity? Yeah, I I I I don't know. I think I I was a postdoc back then. I should I should go back and see. I love this <laughs> the, the slide that Tony Fauci shows of the 2009 pandemic because he shows two curves. He shows a curve where you see that the 2009 H1N1 case is increasing, and then they start coming down, and then there's a second curve of the vaccine being available. That's right, right. And right. the vaccine becoming available is exactly when the virus was, was no longer That's at right. high levels. And the, again, he uses the point of needing to have a higher, a, a faster vaccine response. But it's a good question, Vincent. I'm not sure what level of testing that vaccine went through. Yeah, it was an inactivated a, vaccine, right? A monovalent yeah, vaccine. Yeah. I mean, it's a big strain change, right? So it, we were, well, I guess it was, we were having both H3 and uh, H, 1977, H1 still circulating. So, you know, but 
I mean, I, th- I guess the, the point we are with flu is that we're comfortable at just changing the strain and doing limiting testing. And whether that's going to be the same for SARS-CoV-2, uh, I, I guess it will be because that's what we're doing for Omicron boosters, right? I'm, I'm curious yeah. to, go, to go back to your flu vaccine. You said the flu, the current flu vaccine gets a bad rap. You know, everybody trashes it. And they say every time there's a mismatch, we get a lot of deaths. But you seem to have said it's not that, it's not that bad. So can you clarify? <laughs> well, when, when there is an antigenic mismatch, yeah. the virus does. When there's an antigenic advancement, you mm-hmm. do have more virus spreading, right. not only because that virus is circumventing vaccine-induced immunity, but population-based infection-induced immunity as well. And mm-hmm. so when you see these antigenic, major antigenic drift events, it does tend to be a bad flu season. For sure, when the vaccine strain is mismatched with the circulating strain, vaccine effectiveness goes way down, mm-hmm. sometimes to zero. And uh, 2014-15 was a, a year where that was certainly the case. Right. It was a major antigenic mismatch. But again, VE vaccine effectiveness there is measuring something different. You know, for example, primary care uh, visits. Mm. And so the CDC does not at least make it public or track very carefully deaths uh, uh, caused by flu, at least in the adult populations. They report pediatric deaths. Right. Right. But it's hard to get a good handle about how many uh, adult deaths are, re- are reduced each year by flu vaccination. Uh, but there have been some studies reported by the CDC and others showing that even in these mismatch years, uh, there, there is a great reduction in, uh, in, in flu caused deaths, even when the vaccine is mismatched. Why is that the case? Well, Antibodies do other things than just neutralize. The, mm. We think about the vaccine induces antibodies uh, uh, against the very top of HA. Those antibodies physically prevent the virus from getting into cells. Those are the kind of antibodies you want. They're neutralizing antibodies, but they're antibodies against some of these other, other domains, such as the, the stock domain. And they work by processes like ADCC. They work by um, you know clearing not so much virus, but clearing virally infected cells, eliminating virally infected cells, preventing those cells from spreading new virus. So, um, you know, those antibodies and, and those kind of responses are good to have around. They don't prevent infection, but they prevent the virus from, from spreading. And, and that's where you see okay. uh, the protection against severe disease and death. So you, you mentioned in your paper the other approaches to... Uh a broader flu vaccine, that is the universal vaccine where they use just the stem of the HA, right? So could you just put the stem in your mRNA vaccine? Would that be worth doing? Yeah. I mean, I love the stem approach. I don't think (laughs) our approach is, you know, in, you know, it's not the 20 HA vaccine versus the stem approach or the stock approach. I think they're both good approaches. And, um, yeah, so the VRC has made stem headless, what we call headless uh, mm-hmm. constructs, which is just the stem or stock. And the Ichabod strain. <laughs> what, what do we call that? What was that? Ichabod. Go ahead, Dixon, tell oh, us. I said the Ichabod strain. Okay. You know, the headless horseman from uh, the, um, the Washington Irving uh, stories. Headless horseman. You know, you, you must be familiar with that. He's a young guy. I, he may not know it. I got you. See, I, I got to sharpen up uh, uh, with, with, with that. Uh, so mRNA vaccines are being developed based on that construct. And okay. we'll, we'll see what the data look like. Mount Sinai has a, a great approach uh, that I'm sure you've heard of where there are sequential mm-hmm. immunizations with viruses that have different heads or different yeah. uh, antigens with different heads, the same stock. The idea of just reinforcing the stock response. You know, I, I think that's a great approach. But why just stop at the head, right? or, or why why just stop at the stalk? You know, I think that's that's kind of something that I wonder about. I think there are other cross reactive or conserved epitopes in the head mm-hmm. within mm-hmm. each subtype. I mean, trying to get a stalk antibody, some of those recognize, you know, four or five different subtypes. Why why limit it there? I think there's some probably very important H6 specific okay. epitopes and H7 specific epitopes. That might not be cross subtype, but specific within that epitope. So with the mRNA, again, where you have like sort of an endless 
or uh, you know, somewhat endless supply of antigens, why not just put them all in there? Is there any value to having other proteins, neuraminidase, for example, in there? It's a good question. And there are several groups looking at that. Norby Pardee has partnered up with Florian Kramer, and they have a few nice papers looking at mRNAs with yeah. M2 and NA. Mm -hmm. uh, again, those antibodies usually are not neutralizing, but can do the job of preventing virus spread. Got it. So let me just make sure I have this right. So the idea is this 20-HA mRNA vaccine, you get it when you're a kid, and then if we have a particularly drifted strain or one year, you get boosted to give you, and maybe not kids, but maybe older people who are at risk for getting severe disease, even if they get infected at all, you give them a booster, maybe with an mRNA vaccine for whatever is circulating. Is that the idea? Yeah, no, I, I think you get that each year. You continue to get an influenza mm -hmm. vaccine, and I think you're going to see those much better, uh, you know, and I, I think the mRNA technology will do a better job matching the strain mm -hmm. that's circulating mm -hmm. out there because the duration of production is shorter compared to egg-based vaccines. We no longer have this problem of egg adaptation a lot of times, and that, I think that's what I was on the, the show yeah. for last time, just right. describing how when the vaccines produce in eggs, you, actually, you often get mutations that can change the antigenic structure. So that's not a problem with mRNA. Uh, a lot of advantages, but again, we need to continue to have those kind of seasonal vaccines to uh, get the high levels of neutralizing antibodies. And see, you know, flu is unpredictable in a major way, uh, but, uh, but we do see, you know, in the Northern Hemisphere, for example, there's a few months where it circulates. So we can get a very well-matched vaccine. Um, it's given uh, a month before the flu season starts and a longer live vaccine in the form of mRNA. I, I think we continue to do that, but this vaccine serves as, as, as a vaccine you get once, maybe in childhood, maybe you can get it in adulthood. It seems like pre-existing immunity is not that big of an issue with this vaccine. It gives you sort of, as you said earlier, sort of the blessings of memory um, to many strains. Um, and then you can add on some neutralizing antibodies on top of those blessings of memory B cells. That's right. You look during the, the 2009 pandemic, another example, mm -hmm. what did we find? We found during the 2009 pandemic that older folks were really protected against the 2009 mm -hmm. pandemic. And it's because they saw very different H1N1 viruses in their childhood. It's the same kind of idea, you know, to have those memory B cells in that situation get, get recalled. Right so, now, we have very few memory B cells against some of these subtypes that we have never seen in the human population. So the goal is to induce memory yeah. B cells against those. By the way, uh, I, I spoke with Jeff Taubenberger a couple of months ago, and he said every influenza virus in humans today all derived from 1918. In some way or the other, huh? Yeah, right? Re reassortance or whatever. Yeah, it's pretty amazing, right? Everything before that seems to have been interesting. Uh, I don't know, out-competed or whatever. I, that was so, something I hadn't thought of. That was pretty striking. I have a question about migrating birds and f climate change and the change of the vi virus every year. Uh, as climate change uh, takes its horrible grip on the earth and uh, reduces the need for migration because a lot of migration is due to weather, and uh, we can see Canada geese hanging around all kinds of eastern seaboard settings now that he never used to be here before. I think they're here because the weather changed and uh, the climate went along, or, or the other way, actually, the climate changed and the weather went along with it. Um, so do you, do you see a time when a, a certain strain of flu will be continuously transmitted throughout the year rather than just seasonal because we're, we're really disrupting the seasons, basically, by our climate change behavior? Yeah, so... Just to be clear, the viruses that are in humans now, H1 and H3, they aren't hopping back and forth between birds and humans. Those are established in humans and going human to human. And the seasonality that we see is uh, complex, but likely due to things like differences in temperature and relative humidity and uh, people aggregating indoors. We still right. It's amazing. You would think we would, from a flu community, we fully understand what caused seasonal flu. But... Just to be clear, those viruses are human to human year round. And Got it. 
Uh, but but to your bigger point, yeah, climate change and having animals uh, in different parts of the world where they haven't been before uh, is certainly affecting uh, things like the spread of avian influenza virus right now. Uh, and and I think uh, it's clear uh, that that this is something that's that we have to uh, look at moving forward. Um, it's a uh, the last few years have just been a scary situation with with global uh, with global warming, and it's hard, right? You know, is it the things we're seeing as far as weather patterns? Is this just a normal? Certainly, this is way out of my zone of expertise. Uh, <laughs> but is this, you know, is this just sort of normal stuff that that you see? Uh, you know, we're having a warm winter. I mean, that's is this uh, is this a, a global warming thing or just variation that you see from year to year? But yeah. man, it it sure seems like we are just living among chaos when you look at uh, some of the natural disasters that we've encountered over over the last I few agree. years. And the younger generation, I mean, this is this is it. We yeah, study viruses and um, we make better vaccines, but we got to get a handle on on. Uh, global warming and what we've done to right. our planet. It's, uh, say you say you do figure out which epitopes are really critical, uh, regardless of which strain of virus is out there, because they share that one in common. Uh, do you imagine a time when, uh, I hate to use this word herd immunity, but I will now, because uh, let's say every, let's say 80% of the population of a given region now is fully vaccinated. Do you, do you, you see a way of uh, interfering with transmission to the point where it doesn't even occur as a result of these universal vaccines. Yeah. I mean, that question is like is well, reminiscent of the first uh, <laughs> days of the COVID vaccine. Yeah, uh, I know. Rollout. That's why I, 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 I hesitated a little bit there. As you so I think, you know, most, <laughs> most uh, evolutionary folks, I think would make the argument that vaccine is going to reduce the level of virus replication uh, so that the chances of having new variants would just be diminished. I think that's the argument that most folks would uh, would would right. use to that, and and I agree with that. If you if you're if you're stopping virus spread sure. throughout sure. the population, sure. there's just gonna be less opportunity for those random mutations to occur. This is all random. The mutations. It's the selection mm -hmm. part that is uh, you know really dictated by by immunity. So uh, Scott, how how long before your vaccine might get into people. Have you thought about that? Well, we're, yeah. So we right now are producing GMP, lots of, of these mm. vaccines and NIAID, NIH is very interested in, spo in sponsoring that part of it. Uh, there's a lot of production hurdles that we're up against. This gets, this gets out of my realm of expertise, just like climate change does. <laughs> um, but, but there's a lot of things to consider and it's interesting during this, uh, phase of, of the study where we are really thinking about how to translate this and working with people that are experts of production. For example, if you have a 20 valent HA mRNA vaccine, how do you quantify to make sure all 20 components are at equal levels? And okay, so you have to develop assays to do that. And mm -hmm. well, what's tolerable? Can you have one that's 1% more than the other? Yeah, right. uh, those are the kind of things that we're working out now. We're, we're partnered up with the civics program that's sponsored by the NIH, and we're working with Duke. Duke is one of the sites for the civics. I'm, I run one of the SEER centers, the Center of Excellence for Influenza Research and Response. The civics is sort of the parallel program that, that focuses more on vaccine development. Uh, so we're working with the civics uh, uh, program at Duke uh, to make these GMP lots. And with any luck, we'll, we'll start phase one testing, uh, at the end of this year or in 2024. So we're not too far away. We may start with something that is not 20 valent. We may start with something that it has five or six HAs, uh, just for proof of principle that we can make these GMP lots. Uh, but I, I do think the original goal of inducing immune memory against anything that we may encounter in the future, uh, it's important to get as highly valent as, as we possibly can. Okay. So it's not going to be on your, uh, you know, you're not going to be going to CVS in, uh, you know, in, in two months to get the vaccine, but we do hope to have some human data. <laughs> <Make it> three months. <laughs> yeah, I'm ready. 
phase one studies hopefully will start this year and it's great. Uh, we'll see. Fantastic. I have one more question and that is, uh, did you try to immunize mice against the um, polyvalent uh, vaccine containing one through 19 and then challenging with strain 20 to see if the 19 might, might actually interfere with just one of the, uh, strains that you didn't give or, or are they all necessary? That's the point. So you don't have to answer this question, but I just want to know, are you reviewer number two? <laughs> <laughs> the answer is, I wish I had the uh, background in order to do that, but I do not. But I, I certainly uh, used to do a lot of uh, vaccine work with regards to the organism I worked on, trichinella. And there are strains of trichinella too, of course, uh, but it's a much larger organism with more, more epitopes, et cetera. Um, but, you know, just doing a, a mathematical approach to this, which which of the 20 are more important or are they all important? That's the other question. It, it's a great question. I'm joking with you about reviewer two, but a reviewer uh, <laughs> recommended exactly that experiment and we did it. It's, it's buried probably somewhere in the supplement, but we did exactly that. We made a 19, 19 valent vaccine lacking the H1 component. Right. And, then, and then we challenged with different H1 viruses and the results were kind of confusing actually because oh. what we found was that the 19 valent vaccine could not protect against the matched uh, viral strain in our in our uh, system oh, that would right. argue that you really have to have all 20 all components of, yes. in the vaccine but we did still see protection against that pr8 strain that deadly virus that i told you in oh. mice that mice that mice mm. shriek oh, yeah. about Oh, yeah. And we don't understand it, but presumably there's a shared epitope with one of the other 19 yeah. HAs with, with PR8. And we haven't been able to track that down, but uh, really interesting experiment. Uh, one of those experiments that gets suggested to you during the review process where, you know, a lot of the experiments are sort of incremental and uh, that gets suggested. But that one was a real hmm. interesting one that, that we took very seriously and, and did, did the experiments sure. for. Uh, but I think collectively that it suggests that, you know, having the highly valent uh, vaccine is, is an important part of the vaccine uh, to have essentially just more epitopes available uh, uh, and, and they protect in ways that are a little bit unexpected. In this case, uh, identifying probably a cross-reactive epitope between H5 or one of the other group one viruses with, with PR8. So, so, Scott, are you worried about the, the H5N1 situation? Yeah. Yeah, I am worried. I tell you what, our world is not ready for another pandemic. No, I mean, that's for sure. Imagine if if we had to deal with a pandemic flu strain today. It is uh it is uh it is I'm not ready for it. Uh but I I think, you know, our the political uh culture and the society is not ready for another pandemic. It H5 is uh is a virus that uh, has you know, highly pathic, pathogenic H5 has been around for a while. And uh, of course, we've had some scares before where it looked like there was uh, human infections and even human to human transmission. The good news with the current H5 strain is it's all over the place and we haven't seen human to human mm -hmm. infection. The, the scary part is these infections, for example, at the mink farm in Spain, which was reported a few months ago. Uh, I don't know if it has been definitively shown, but it's almost certain that there was mink to mink transmission in those experiments. Or not yeah. those experiments in in those in the in that natural setting. I mean that gets scary, right? And you see the reports of uh, you know sea lions, otters, uh, you know dropping dead. Yeah, I yeah, mean yeah. that 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 gets into the situation where um, we need to be an alert. Now, you know, should everyone get scared and go you know buy you know you know hundred rolls of toilet paper? You know, I would I would suggest <laughs> against doing that. I don't think we need to be alarmed at that level. But certainly we need to, uh, you know, we need to continue our surveillance and, uh, and be on high alert. What we've done in our lab is we've made a single monovalent HA mRNA vaccine completely matched to that strain circulating. Mm -hmm. Gives great antibody responses in mice. We're now working with uh, a group in St. Jude to test that vaccine in ferrets. Uh, we're completing challenge studies with BSL-3 level uh, uh, high path virus. And we'll have those uh, data available really soon. I mean, the vaccine looks good, and, and we 
There's no reason to think that a different HA would it would behave any any differently in these experiments, but we're doing the experiments anyway. So, um, so I think it's good to remain remain you know prepared for the, for these viruses. But uh, I don't think we have to be alarmed. But uh, there's a lot of signs that make an influenza virologist nervous, mm -hmm. particularly you know the mink to mink transmission, infection of mammals with with these viruses. Are these uh, the first extensive um, mammalian infections that we've seen with H5? Because there have been less than a thousand documented human cases, right? Yeah. Well, with this, with with the current, uh, with the current strain that's circulating, uh, these are the initial reports. Uh, you know, in two thousand five and before, there were there were definitely other cases. Um, what I've read, and I'm not an avian influenza virus expert. But those that I uh, talk to, you know, say that there's no real reason to think that this virus is any more pathogenic than, say, the viruses that circulated in 2005. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But what makes them nervous is just how widespread it is. Yeah. And again, yeah. these the, the the apparent jump from birds to mink and sea otters and that yeah. kind of thing, that's what's making them nervous. Not so much, I mean, the 2005 version was pretty darn pathogenic as well, so... Um, again, what do we have to do? We have to de develop vaccines that are specific to that. Yep. Our group and others are doing that. And uh, we have to remain vigilant. What, if you're a listener what did, out there, don't go pick up a dead bird, you know? I mean, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. So the, the avian influenza experts, do they understand why there have been so many bird infections in the past year? Yeah, I, I I think they're they're working on it. I don't know if it's been <laughs> okay. completely figured out. There's eight gene segments. I like to focus on the one called hemagglutinin, but those other gene segments are yeah. important. And I think there are some polymorphism in the polymerase genes and other genes that okay. may be uh, you know the culprit for allowing the widespread uh, widespread of of, of these five and one. Yeah, so so yeah. since you're the the Sears guy. Who should we get on TWIV for avian influenza expertise? So why, my colleague, Nicola Lewis from the UK, it would be excellent to have on. Uh, so she is part of our SEER program. She runs all of the avian influenza surveillance from our Penn SEER, the, the program that I'm the PI of. We have an extensive uh, avian surveillance program that she leads, including surveillance in Bangladesh. And... Mm -hmm. um, she would be great to have on. I would I would okay. recommend I would recommend her. Uh, she is also uh, has taken over from John McCauley, who is the head of the WHO flu center at the Francis Crick. And so Nicola Lewis now wears that hat. So she has okay. a joint appointment at the Royal Vet College as well as the the Crick Institute. And okay. she is the expert. Uh, I I when Nicola says something about avian influenza viruses, I listen. So, okay. We'll do that. It's, it's, it's interesting that people think they're dissociated from it just because they're not getting sick from it. But my wife and I do a lot of shopping at Costco. And, um, well, not a lot. We go there once a week. And uh, we get our eggs from Costco. And Costco was f out of eggs. They had none because they were selling them at a wholesale, a, a re a wholesale, no, wholesale retail, the cheaper of the two prices. And little stores... Wholesale, I guess. Would come into Costco and buy up, you know, like 40 dozen eggs or something like this and take them back and sell them for a okay. higher price at their own little store. And meaning that there were no eggs at Costco to have, but you could go anywhere else and get them. And that's all traceable back to this H5N1. Also um, traceable is that my local cupcake store um, has <laughs> increased prices because they are having such difficulty getting yeah. eggs. That's incredible. You know, that's absolutely. What yeah. about chickens? Is it, uh, chicken prices going up too? No, those are just the egg laying hens. Just the I egg see. laying hens. That, that okay. There's one heck of an industry out there, right? <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, it, it has been, uh, it has been pointed out and I'll reemphasize it here that chicken eggs are used to produce the great bulk of in <laughs> uh, that's inactive right. that's flu right. vaccine. So, you know, in the case of a, a, a serious avian influenza virus outbreak, uh, you, you got to protect not only the humans, but the, the, the chickens as well. Um, you know, the, mm -hmm. the avian influenza virus folks are also very worried about bird diversity. A lot of mm -hmm. birds getting infected with 
yeah, that's um, true. you know, in the ecology yeah. of, of all of that, there's a lot of birds getting infected. Uh, yep. And uh, what the long term consequences of, of that, it's, it's not clear. Right. They were worried about the West Nile virus for the same reason. And I've, I do a lot of outdoor activities. And over the last 10 years, it, it first hit U.S. in 1999. And you could see a decrease in blue jays and crows and robins and, and uh, other corbidae. And they've all come back, all of them. Uh, so I guess nature, you know, I, I, I told my class this morning, nature abhors a vacuum for lots of different reasons. But uh, this is one way that you can watch uh, evolution at work right in front of your very eyes. Scott, uh, we've kept you long enough. That was great. Absolutely. Vincent, uh, before I go, I don't know if this is possible, but the Philadelphia Eagles are playing in the Super Bowl on Sunday. This is being recorded on a Friday. I'm, uh, presumably the episode will air uh, yeah. next week. So I was wondering on, if we could end. It'll release on Sunday. It will release at midnight on Sunday. So uh, this is perfect timing. I was wondering if we could end with the Super Bowl prediction. And uh, so, you know, it will be, it'll be, by the time this, this, this shows, we'll, we'll, we'll know the, the winner. Uh, we will. Do you, do you, do you partake in, in forecasting? Uh, I don't, or? but he doesn't, but I do. Dixon but I, does. I, I'm, you have to know, uh, Scott, that I'm a dyed in the wolves, New York giants fan. Okay. I, I've been this way since I was like six. Um, so my son lives in Wichita, Kansas, so you can guess who he's going to be rooting for. And uh, that's the Kansas City Chiefs. It's going to be a great game if both quarterbacks don't get injured and if their their star players can really play. They've both got great defenses, and I think, but I think Philadelphia has the edge. I honestly do. And, and uh, my prediction is uh, Philadelphia by three. <laughs> Field goal, huh? Brian, do you have a prediction? You know, I also grew up um, in a very New York Giants house. <laughs> um, but as a result, that means that um, teams in the Giants conference um, get a little the boost. Eastern, yeah, the Eastern. Um, and I'm in New Jersey. Um, so also, uh, I'm going to go for uh, Philadelphia. Philadelphia. I guess we okay, how many points, Brianne? Uh, is this, uh... <laughs> uh, that's, a, that's a good question. Philadelphia by... Seven by seven. Okay. By a touchdown. All right. What about you, Scott? Well, I'm going Philly. Clearly, I I agree with the analysis so far. <laughs> Very good quarterbacks. Good defense. Jalen Hurts is uh, just uh, next level. Uh, our You're quarterback right. for for Philly. He he can run the ball, but he has a cannon. He understands the offense. But it's yep. going to come down to defense. I'm going uh, Philadelphia right. twenty one, right. the Chiefs thirteen. That's my prediction. Hmm. Right. All right. We'll see what happens. Interesting. Scott Hensley, University of Pennsylvania. Thanks so much, Scott, for joining us. All right. Take care, guys. Bye bye. See ya. See ya. Thank you so much. This was yep. so interesting. I really love these papers. Thanks so much. Have have a have a nice one. Take care. Yeah. Bye. Right. Fix it. I like that you take a nap and then you wake up and ask a lot of questions. So, well, you know, <laughs> I was just resting my eyes. Brand, did you I see? I I picked up. This I, did. I, I did. Sleeping. I did see sleeping. it. I was just. Um, these my these eyes. are his walking sticks. I could have hit you on the head. Let me ask you something. When you get finished teaching a class, how do you feel? A little bit down. I don't your, feel down. Your adrenal no. glands sort of just decompress. No, no, no I'm fine. Yeah, I'm, are I'm, you like that? Because I know I am. I'm I good. Just, I, I am not. Um, I'm actually the very much the opposite. But my PhD advisor would often do something where it looked like he fell asleep during a talk, and then he would no. always ask the hardest questions I, I, afterwards. Well, I, I, so I'm not right. fooled. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Exactly right. Since there are only three of us, let's do a couple of email. Sure. And then we can do our picks. Um, let me take the first one from Alan Dove. Alan writes, of course, I know the Sverdlovsk incident involved the Bacillus anthracis, not variola, and I'm mortified I made such a howling blunder while discussing it. <laughs> the point I was trying to make was that it's another red herring often tossed out in the gain-of-function debate. Proponents of increased restrictions cite it as an example of the dangers of infectious disease research when, in fact, it involved not only insufficient safeguards, but also a category of research, bioweapon development, 
that was explicitly banned by international treaty even at the time. In any case, I'm sorry for bungling my facts, Alan. And yes, we got lots of email. Thank you. And, and many people point out, well, this is why you shouldn't be doing dangerous virus research, but this was not research, right? This was <laughs> bioweapon development in a facility that wasn't sufficient to and contain definitely it. definitely not research. Right. So please don't use that as an example of why we have to restrict bona fide research. Right. Anyway, thank you, Alan. We all should have known that, I guess, right? But there was a smallpox release uh, in, elsewhere in 1971, okay? So if you, if you Google smallpox release USSR, you will find that in 1971 in Aral, uh, the Aral smallpox incident was an outbreak of the disease which occurs as a result of a field test at, at a biological weapons facility on an island in the Aral Sea, or Aral, I don't know how to say it. It isn't there anymore. It got, it got drunk up by the agriculture in Russia. <laughs> and, uh, and, it, it, three and it was also died. a bioweapons test. It was a bioweapons test. Three people died. The moral is stop developing bioweapons. Here, here. In fact, folks, why don't you stop killing each other? That right. would be novel. Wouldn't that be nice? Yeah. That sure would be. Uh, Brianne, can you take the next one? Sure. Bill writes, in a recent episode of Kevin Folta's Talking Biotech podcast, he interviewed Kevin Ezevelt, and we have a link. Ezevelt is an MIT professor, and at 445, he claims that, in fact, we've eradicated wild-type polio from the world, and that the only concern of ours now is the vaccine revertant strains. I think this is great news. Not only has the disease been eradicated, but presumably the virus as well. Time to destroy those remaining type 1 stocks, or am I misunderstanding this? After all, Ezevel is an expert on viruses and CRISPR and gene drive, especially CRISPR gene drive, which may be the first self-propagating biotechnology, don't you know? In fact, he seems to have coined the phrase to boot up a virus. Unfortunately, it seems like he was scooped by the only paper to use this term in PubMed. Um, and we have a link. But what other novel terms do people use for this technical process? Startup? Shroot? Clutch start? Alan, is it safe to hand prop a virus? <laughs> but I think there's really something here. Esvelt is the type who simply runs the numbers by plucking out estimates and weaves those with simple eloquence of confidence into a quantitative argument whose only conclusion is that the de novo synthesis of a novel virus genome is how the world will end. I'm no expert, and I won't even go re-download that one DASAC serology study for the numbers, but if you did, what frequency would you estimate that spillovers occur at, and what frequency do pandemics occur at? If you were simply to run the numbers, what kind of death toll and other impacts would you estimate would result, just hypothetically, say across the last two decades? And would that justify that cost justify a research program to survey, catalog, and report the viruses found in human-adjacent zoonotic reservoirs? Asvelt thinks it's not worth the risk. Bill. All right. So, first of all, Asvelt is not a virus expert. Is that re the writer here says Esfelt is an expert on viruses, and he's not because, in fact, type 1 polio has not been eradicated, right? right? So anything you would call yourself is not an expert because you don't even bother to look to see. <laughs> Types 2 and 3 have been eradicated or declared eradicated, but type 1 continues to cause cases in Afghanistan and Pakistan and parts of Africa. Uh, but, in fact, yes, uh, type 2 and 3 vaccine derived strains are circulating, mainly type 2, and they're a problem, and most likely will foil the eradication effort because it's going to be really hard to get rid of those. So um, the DASHAC serology study, Lin Fa Wang actually did that. A couple percent of people in rural China have antibodies to, you know, coronaviruses from bats, so people are getting in yeah, spillover happens. All sure. The time. Well, and and thinking about, you know, that's just coronaviruses. And, you know, he asks what frequency would you uh estimate that spillovers occur at? That I, I feel a little biased perhaps because of um some of the conversations I had in one of my classes this week. Um, but I kind of want to know how he defines a spillover. Does it is it defined as a virus going from one person or one animal to one person, or do we have to get a further transmission to a second person? Yeah. Because if it's just yeah. one 
from one animal to one person, I think it happens really frequently. Sure. No, I agree. Um, I think I would define it as one person. And right. heck, when you eat cabbage, you're eating insect viruses. Mm -hmm. They yeah. pass they pass through you, but I, it's in you. So, I think his the SFL doesn't want us to look at these potentially dangerous viruses. I would disagree. I think we need to study them and understand how they work and what they can do. And you know, sure, you could say I don't. I think it's too dangerous. You can run numbers, but I'm sorry, I don't. I don't buy numbers. I think we need to know the mechanisms of how these viruses. Right could infect human cells, could cause disease and so forth. Sure. And if you th think your numbers uh, trump that, you're wrong because then you don't understand uh, virological research. Yeah. I, I don't know how you can use numbers to um, develop a new antiviral um, that might stop some other virus, but you can do that from knowing some things about the biology of that virus. I mean, you um, can argue. Or a vaccine or all sorts of things. For sure. Yeah. And you could argue, and I have, that you, we could have had an antiviral for SARS-CoV-2 right. by getting some of those bat viruses and look, getting their polymerases out and developing pan. We could have done it, but there was mm -hmm. no support because many people thought, oh, SARS-1 went away. This will too. And <sighs> forget about NIH to support it. You know, so the problem is the pharmaceutical companies won't touch it because there's no market. market. Right. And NIH doesn't have enough money to do everything that's needed. So it's a real problem. Yep. Uh, Dixon, can you take yes, the one next? I certainly can. Uh, Lanny writes, Hi, I'm a regular TWIV listener and wanted to chime in about your conversations regarding abacavir use and cellular senescence. I'm a physician assistant specializing in the primary care and HIV care. I use abacavir in conjunction, am I pronouncing that correct, abacavir? Sure. Uh, in conjunction with other antiretrovirals, um, ARVS, to treat HIV in a handful of my patients. More commonly, other NRTI agents are the backbone of a complete ARV regimen. I hope everybody understands what those initials stand for. First, up to date. Uh, first, to update you on the proper terminology, it is preferential to use the term stage 3 HIV instead of AIDS due to the stigma associated with the word AIDS and the mistakenly common notion that AIDS is a death sentence. Stage 1 HIV is an absolute CD4 uh, greater than 500 stage. It is a uh, less than 500 stage. It is a CD4 count of 200 to 500. And stage three is a CD4 count of uh, less than 200. Using the phase, uh, phrasing stage three HIV more accurately reflects the idea that someone with a low CD4 count has the potential to recover their CD4 cells and the immune function with proper ARV therapy. That being said, we can use abacavir in all its stages of HIV treatment. We, will, we always check an HIV B5701 allele, a blood test, prior to starting abacavir-based ARV regimens, since patients who carry this allele are at higher risk of a hypersensitivity reaction to abacavir. I also counsel my patients on the potential for increased cardiovascular adverse effects, i.e. heart attack, with abacavir. There is conflicting evidence on this matter, but some, but not all, observation studies, observational studies have shown increased cardiovascular diseases and cardiovascular events. So in patients in, at high risk of cardiovascular disease, such as patients with diabetes, uncontrolled blood pressure, hypo, uh, hyperlipidemia, or certain uh, ethnic, ethnic backgrounds, I review the possible link to increased cardiovascular risk and have a discussion with the patient whether they want to continue their current ARVs or switch to a regimen without abacavir. Also, we routinely get bone density tests from patients living with HIV starting at age 50. We do this because both HIV and some of the medications we use to treat HIV can cause decreased bone density. I agree it would be very interesting to pull some data to compare the bone densities and or uh, 
charted diagnosis of osteoarthritis in patients living with HIV, comparing the HRV uh, regimens to see whether Abacavir is beneficial or not. Perhaps I will try to get approval to do that one one day. Anyway, I hope the above information was useful. I can't thank you enough for your podcasts. I really enjoy your honest and inquisitive dialogue. Regards, Lonnie. Yeah, we were wondering about the use of uh, Abacavir. That was the drug they used in the um, senescence paper. Yes. Uh-huh. Right? To uh, yes, 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 yes. put it in cells and show that when you inhibited RT, the cells lost some of their senescence markers. That's cool. I, I haven't heard this getting away from AIDS. Have you, uh, Brian? I have not. Because all the posters in the subway here in New York <laughs> still have AIDS <laughs> on them, right? Right. They, they advertise PrEP. That's a big mm-hmm. one. Yeah. Well, you don't go on the subway, do you, Dixon? I do not. I do. I do a lot. And uh, there's all kinds of PrEP signs. Wow. Uh, and so they got AIDS. They have AIDS uh, in the signs as well. All right. Let's do some picks. Okay. Dixon, you go first. Well, um, thank you for that privilege because it's, it's my chance to really um, uh, flesh out my uh, passion for listening and playing jazz. And so now we, and you'd think that by now I had exhausted the subject, but of course not because uh, we're up to guitar, to guitar as a jazz instrument uh, and we've gone through the big bands and the small groups and the singers and the individual instruments, and now we're, we're down to guitar. We have two more instruments to go through. Uh, Django Reinhardt is recognized as the progenitor for modern guitar playing with regards to jazz and, and was a post, and it was actually during the Second World War and then afterwards in Paris that Django Reinhardt teamed up with um, Stepan Grappelli, who was a violinist, to produce some absolutely charming, wonderful jazz that preceded most of the modern jazz that we now take for granted today, like from Miles Davis and uh, Ella Fitzgerald, etc. Django Reinhardt and Stefan Grappelli produced music that's worthwhile listening to. It's understandable, it's wonderful, and I highly recommend it. But uh, he is no longer alive, and, and Stefan Grappelli died recently as well, so we don't have that team any longer to listen to. We have the records, of course. The modern uh, takeover for guitar playing, jazz guitar playing, in my opinion, is Pat Metheny. Pat Metheny is an absolute genius at playing the guitar. He expresses himself beautifully. He makes melodies and melodies within melodies, and they're understandable and they're uh, repeatable. And uh, you enjoy listening to them, even if you've heard them several times already. His signature album is Still Life Talking, and the signature song from it is Last Train Home. And I dare say (laughs) that you've heard Last Train Home playing as background music in most supermarkets now. I don't know why, but every time I go to the Acme, I hear Last Train Home. Vincent, you should pay attention to that song because you do take the train home. Uh, and if you miss it, then you you have to stay in the incubator. Um, Joe Pass, <laughs> uh, Ella Fitzgerald's favorite guitar accompanist, um, was he also, unfortunately, he's passed. Uh, Joe Pass and I... Uh, crossed paths once at a meeting that I was attending in Denver and it was there was a heavy snowstorm that accompanied the meeting and uh, he was playing at one of the hotels and a, a friend of mine and I went to see Joe Pass play to an audience of four people and he played. He did not he did not pack up his guitar and go home. He played and he would take requests. So I, I had a request around midnight that was no. That was not the time. That was the request. There was a song called "Round Midnight," and Joe Pass yelled up at me. He says, "Are you a jazz fan?" And I said, "Yes, very much so." So when he finished playing, it was his last song. He came up and joined us, and he had drinks with us until the wee hours wow. in the morning and wow. regaled us with all kinds of stories about what it's like to play with Ella Fitzgerald and how wonderful a woman she was and how generous she was, etc. So those are moments in my life that I would never forget. And um, 
So that's why I picked Joe Pass. He was also a very, very uh, gifted guitar player. That's a great story. Yeah, and uh, the Virtuoso is his album, uh, signature album, and the song on that is Round Midnight, of course. And uh, mm. it's played a lot on the radio, so you do get to hear it. <clears throat> and nice. uh, he was uh, pleased and honored that I should have known that. And uh, then when I asked him to play it, he gladly did. Nice. Yeah. Very good. Do you have more uh, more instruments coming up, or is this it? I do. We haven't covered the piano yet, and we haven't covered the drums yet, and nor we have covered the harmonica yet, and the bass. Huh. Neat. We have lots of uh, good stuff ahead, and then we have to pick a goat. I was walking down 30th Street yeah. uh, the other day towards 9th Avenue, and I passed a drum store. Oh, right. And the name of it is like, we rescue drums. <laughs> like, and there was a guy inside fixing a drum. You know, it's like the old stores yeah. where they fix things. You know, oh, nobody yeah. fixes things. But this area used to have uh, st recording studios. And so there are some music shops left. And that's. Oh, there's a whole district in New York. Come on. There's uh, around 47th Street off of 6th Avenue. You can go there. It's the music district and you can walk in and you can actually sit down and play some of these instruments. And mm, cool. in fact, my wife bought me my trombone by just doing that. I had the honor of going into the back room and playing the instrument. It was fun to just do that because professional guys go in and yeah, women do cool. that as well. But I, I, I fantasized about that the whole time I did it. Brian, what do you have for us? I feel uh, like that's a hard act to follow. <laughs> um, so I have um, a HHMI site um, called HHMI's Virus Explorer. Um, and so this is a site that gives you some information about a few different viruses, um, lets you see a structure, a cross-section, a replication cycle. You can pick um, viruses that infect humans or plants or things like that. Um, and it will also resize all of the viruses to show them with relative sizes to one another. Um, and so if someone is, say, looking for something uh, for, you know, teaching purposes, uh, it's a nice resource uh, to talk about some basic virology. It's very nice. Hmm. Yeah, it's done really well. But no polio. No <laughs> polio. How can you not have polio? Why don't you add it and send it to them? No. HHMI has their own agenda. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly. They think polio has probably been eradicated. They, I was going to say, they they must have talked to that guy who said polio right. was eradicated. <laughs> Kevin, what's his name? Yes, indeed. Uh, I have a, a musical pick also. Okay. Um, I've been listening to this uh, man for the last couple of weeks. My my son, Aiden, who is a, um, he's a, he's a amateur DJ. He has a, a board and he oh, neat. mixes and he sometimes goes to his friend's party and plays and uh, he, he actually has a few pieces on SoundCloud. Is that what it's called? MixCloud, I think it's called. Yeah, I think it's MixCloud. Sure. Let's see. Uh, yeah, MixCloud. And I listen to them when I treadmill. It's because they're very high uh, beats per minute and they're perfect for this. <laughs> pace. Anyway, so he said I should listen to Chris Luna, who's a, a German DJ. And I really like his mixes. Now, the DJs, Dixon, they don't actually Understood. create music, but they remix. No, 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 I got it. I know you know, remixing is a big thing nowadays. You can be oh, very yeah. creative, and people make livings doing this. this anyway. all true. And there are all different sorts of, of uh, mixes you can make. But he, oh, my gosh, there's so many kinds of electronic music. You know, there's, yeah. there's house and and everything. Anyway, he does these, and they're very... You know, they have a great beat, and he, he does them in, in location. So there are videos on YouTube. He'll be on a rooftop in Berlin, or he'll be on a balcony in Bali, or uh, on a boat. Um, it's just cool to see him in this location, and he's got his little board there, and he plays. But the music is quite chill, I would say. I really like it. I often have it playing here uh, at the incubator when I'm doing things that don't doesn't matter if you have music playing. So if you like uh, electronic music, um, you'll, you'll like this. But remember, the electronic music is meant to dance to largely, and it's somewhat it's, it's somewhat monotonous, if I should use that term, but it doesn't bother me it's at all. It's repetitious, but not monotonous. Yeah, I would call it repetitious yeah. is the good word, yes. No, it's like uh, listening to chants. In a way. 
Uh, but, you know, he mixes different pieces. And you can find the original pieces elsewhere. But the way he blends yeah. them yeah. Is, is just part of the creative process that I think is really good. And people really love how DJs blend from one song into another. And you, know, you get the mm -hmm. other one coming up in the back. It's not just simply blending, but you can do right. elements that are said. So anyway, Chris Luno uh, from, uh, from Germany is very cool. We have two listener picks. John writes... I listened with great interest to 958, especially about your comments on the density and movement of white-tailed deer in the U.S. and across the Canadian border. As a biogeographer who has been working to model and somehow get a handle on the data regarding deer density in the U.S., I thought you might like to look at a map my lab has created using a whole host of data sources, including the U.S. Forest Service and the USDA. So uh, there are two links here of... Um, one is of the whole U.S. and then one is of New York State area where the deer are. It's very cool. If you click on the interactive legend, the map will highlight the density ranges. The data are another one of those you would think we would know it, pieces of information. Right. We really have no idea at the scales that would be of real interest and no real data on group interactions. One of the things my lab is most interested in is the correlation between animal movement and the spread of disease, both animal and zoonotic. We currently know very little about animal movement ecology, especially in disturbed environments, and this leads me to my listener pick. There's a new book called The Theory of the Spread of Epidemics and Movement Ecology of Animals. It's Cambridge University Press 2021, which nicely summarizes some of what we know and the difficulties of modeling and getting empirical data. It's really a complex problem, and the field data on animal movement is sparse nor systematically collected. I love your podcast. Stay well, John is a lecturer at Johns Hopkins University. And Jessica writes, I hope you like this. Thanks for your wonderful podcast. And she sends a link to a article. Uh, Classic Cases Revisited, Oscar the Cat and Predicting Death. Um, Oscar the cat uh, was born in the U.S. and a resident feline practitioner at a nursing home. He was noted for his ability to identify dying patients. And clinicians, having spotted the cat's ability for impending death, did not buy a mass spectrometer to look for the particle or apoptosis or <laughs> aerosolized marker of death. They harnessed the seemingly unachievable feline certainty to help families at a difficult time. Lacking such an asset within the majority of critical care units, we are faced with uncertainty. So it's all about, right, mm -hmm. Oscar the Cat and Predicting Death. Mm. It's an article in Journal of the Intensive Care Society. Well, thank you for that, Jessica. That's, that's nature's gas chromatograph. <laughs> yeah, why not, right? Uh, animals can do that sort of thing. Dolphins, mm -hmm. too. There are lots of animals yeah. help us out. That is... TWIV number 983. The show notes are at microbe.tv slash TWIV. You can send us questions, comments, picks of the week, ramblings, whatever you want. <laughs> Just be nice. <laughs> TWIV at microbe.tv. And if you enjoy our work, we would love your financial support. You can go to microbe.tv slash contribute for all the variety of ways you can contribute many online, but others involve sending physical checks. And weekly I get a few checks here at the incubator. It's always a pleasure to open up the mailbox and find some of your, in some cases, handwritten checks with little notes of appreciation. I really love that. That's just great. Microbe.tv slash contribute. Dixon de Pommier is at trichinella.org and thelivingriver.org. Thank you, Dixon. Thank you. You're welcome, Vincent. It was a pleasure again to be part of the group in the uh, in situ portion of your uh, empire. I guess when you're done with your course, you won't be coming here anymore. Uh, does it, that doesn't mean that at all. Yeah, I think it is. No, no. Well, you informed me today that your evenings are yours. So, Well... Mostly. <laughs> Dixon, <laughs> when is your course over? Like May something, May. right? It's in May. All right. It's in May. Brianne Barker is at Drew University Bioprof Barker on Twitter. Thanks, Brianne. Thanks. It was great to be here. I learned a lot. 
I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I would like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV, Ronald Jenkins for the music, and Jolene for the timestamps. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week on another TWIV is viral.